refers to the time of year in the spring when the days become longer than the nights. But for the person who knows Jesus Christ, Easter means a lot more than that. It means that even though Jesus died, salvation didn't. Even though Jesus was buried, hope wasn't. Because Jesus is alive. Easter means there is forgiveness for my failures, grace for my guilt, and mercy for my misery. Easter means that the pain and the silence of living in a Saturday world isn't purposeless and it isn't permanent. Easter means that I can't out the grace of God and I can't outrun the reach of God. It means that Jesus is King, light overcomes darkness, and justice will win, and brokenness will be broken. Easter means that the scars on the hands of Jesus are telling a story of victory, not defeat. And the same is true for me. It means that I am not alone, not ashamed, not forgotten, and not forsaken. It means that the rain and the storms and the wind and the waves of this world will not have the last word because my future is a resurrected body with the resurrected Jesus on a resurrected earth. Easter means that I can join with a choir of saints and angels singing, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh grave, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your song? Easter means that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for me. Easter means that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. is risen indeed. Alleluia. My name is Pastor Doug and I am the pastor here at Portage United Methodist Church in Portage, Wisconsin. It is my privilege to welcome you to this worship video for Easter Sunday, April 4th, 2021, as we celebrate the resurrection and the life found in Christ. As you are watching this video, we would invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to like our Facebook page, to comment on these videos and uh, respond with your thoughts, your questions, your reflections, and then to share them on your own social media so that we can continue to offer this online worship experience for those who need it. Music centers us as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
worship. The words will appear on your screen. Gathered together across time and space, we greet the morning filled with wonder. This is the good news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen, indeed. Alleluia. Please join me with hymn 302, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. God of resurrection, once again your presence is made known in the dawning of a new day, the advent of a new season, and the promise of an empty tomb. You overcame death and raised Jesus to life, proving once and for all that nothing can ever stand in the way of your coming kingdom. And yet, we still have a hard time believing the good news when we hear it, even with the evidence staring us in the face. Fear of loss, of grief, trap us in old patterns, and we choose what is familiar over your life-giving way. Forgive us, O oh God. Open our eyes to see the true glory of these moments. Help us realize things work differently now because of what you've done. Make us part of your great Easter work here and now, and give us what we need to share your good news with all the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture today comes from John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been moved from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there 
as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever noticed how in many stories there often seems to be at least one person who notices things that others don't? Whether they actively go looking for these things, are simply more observant, or just happen to be in the right place at the right time. They see things, both good and bad, that are important to the plot. And yet, whenever they try to tell someone, no one believes them. For whatever reason, the other characters either do not have the time or are not willing to listen. They brush it off ignoring efforts to be heard and too often the person who sees ends up being written off as crazy as having imagined it or as too naive to understand what is really going on lucy pevensey of c.s lewis's the chronicles of narnia is a good example she was the youngest of four siblings and the first to discover the magical land of narnia by going through the upstairs wardrobe what she found was amazing, an enchanted forest where it was always winter, an iron lamppost oddly out of place in the middle of a clearing, and a fawn, Mr. Tumnus, with whom she shared a cup of tea. Inspired by and in awe of what she saw in Narnia, Lucy returned, wanting very much to share it with the others. But unfortunately, things did not go well for her. When Lucy tried to tell her siblings about everything on the other side of the wardrobe, they didn't believe her. It was just too extraordinary for them to wrap their minds around. They thought that perhaps she was making things up or playing some sort of game to pass the time. Even when her brother Edmund stumbled into the winter forest on his own, where he was found by Lucy, the others still were not willing to accept what she was saying. In many ways, the character of Lucy Pevensey is intentionally representative of the women who followed Jesus. We know this because C.S. Lewis made no bones about where he got the source material for his writing. She is smart, curious, observant, and also wise for her age. She has a kind heart that is always reaching out to others, and she is open to seeing things even when the people around her are not. Likewise, the women who followed Jesus are often portrayed as quite keen and aware. They were able to see beyond the hustle and bustle of everyday living, to offer care and compassion to those in need, and to express wisdom and understanding not often heard from others. They noticed what God was doing, particularly in the person of Jesus, and they wanted to be part of it. In fact, these women ended up being a near constant presence and a driving force throughout Jesus' ministry. This was especially true during the hard, painful events that took place the week between Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the resurrection on Easter morning. The women were a part of the processional that made its way through the city and then returned to Bethany later that evening. They were there as Jesus was slandered, maligned, and falsely accused at the trial. They watched as he was tortured, humiliated, and put to death. They heard his last words. They saw him take his final breaths, and they knew where his body was laid to rest after it was taken down. It should come as no surprise, then, that these women would have been among the first to show up the morning after the Sabbath. Things had had to be rushed after the crucifixion on account of the Passover festival, which meant that there hadn't been time to finish everything properly. The women were willing to do this work, and scripture tells us that it was still dark when they arrived to complete the burial ritual. When Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had already been removed, a thousand questions must have flashed through her mind. Who could have stolen the body? Why would they have done it? Where was it hidden now? She pushed those aside and went straight away to where the disciples were hiding. She told them what she had seen, and both Simon Peter and the other disciple came to look for themselves. They arrived to find everything exactly as she had said, and they believed that Jesus' body was gone. But that was it. Scripture says, then they returned to their homes, and Mary 
was left alone in the garden, weeping outside the tomb. Neither Lucy Pevensey nor Mary Magdalene are the only ones whose voices were not heard or believed by those around them. Throughout much of our history, right down to the present day, there are those within our communities as well as our society whose voices are ignored or otherwise pushed aside. We see this in the ongoing struggle for racial justice as people of color and their allies fight to have their voices heard. In July 2013, after George Zimmerman was acquitted in the shooting death of African-American teen Trayvon Martin, some of those voices broke through our status quo. They gained national prominence during the protests following two more African-American deaths, Michael Brown of Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Gardner of New York, New York, both of which involved altercations with the police. Their voices were clearly present throughout the events of last summer, and they are currently supporting those calling for justice for Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the wake of the attacks in Atlanta on March 16th this year. And yet, despite how widespread their movement has become in the last few years, our society still seems to want to sweep it under the rug. Despite how clearly they have articulated themselves, how readily apparent the issues of systemic injustice are, there are many who continue to ignore or even undermine these voices. The same has been true in the struggle for gender equality. Following the exposure of widespread sexual abuse allegations against Harvey Weinstein in October of 2017, Voices calling for change and for justice re-emerged into the public sphere. They quickly gained national and even global attention through their use of the hashtag MeToo, trying not only to give victims assurance that they were not alone, but also to show people the magnitude of the problem. Millions of folks have shared their stories, and the movement has spread to other countries around the world, and yet it still feels like they're being ignored. It still feels like there are those more interested in undermining these voices than in actually making the necessary change. What we are witnessing here and in many other places is a failure to listen, an unwillingness to even acknowledge where we may have overlooked something or been going down the wrong path. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, justice, mercy, compassion, victory over death, is still being drowned out by the powers and principalities of the world. Like the disciples, we fear being ostracized, losing our status, maybe even losing our lives, and that keeps us from fully recognizing and embracing the promise of resurrection. Our story from the Gospel of John does not end with the disciples leaving Mary alone and returning to their homes. If it had, the testimony would have been incomplete, and we wouldn't have received the same assurance of good news. Instead, it goes on to tell us that as she stood outside the tomb weeping, Mary saw two angels sitting where Jesus' body had been laid to rest. They asked her why she was crying. Then they listened as she responded, giving voice to her pain and her hurt. Immediately after this, Mary was approached by a man who turned out to be Jesus, though she did not recognize him at first. He, too, asked her why she was crying and listened as she shared her frustration and her sorrow. Far from dismissing Mary or explaining away what she was feeling, Jesus met her where she was, in the midst of her grief, and offered her what she needed most. He spoke her name aloud. He made it clear that she had been seen and heard, and he gave her proof of the resurrection. To hear a familiar voice brought both reassurance and comfort. Being able to see Jesus again and to touch him gave Mary hope, not only for those moments, but for the future as well. The fact that he stood there before her, very much alive, meant that death was no longer the end. Challenges, hardships, and difficult times would not last forever. No matter what the world tried to throw their way, God's power to bring life and to restore what was lost would always be greater. Many of us can probably relate to this sort of thing, if for no other reason than we are experiencing it ourselves right now. 
After over a year of having to make significant changes to our behavior and restrict movements because of the coronavirus, we are finally starting to see things turn in a more positive direction. We may not be quite out of the woods yet, but the pressure seems to be letting up, and there appears to be a light at the end of the tunnel. We have reasons to be hopeful again. People are getting vaccinated, and as they do, it becomes easier and safer for them to reach out and to reconnect with one another. Grandparents who have gotten their shots are being told that they can hug their grandkids again. Friends and loved ones can gather together in ways that they haven't been able to for a while, provided they are all vaccinated. We can start planning and start working toward a day when we will move beyond this strange world of hypervigilance and strict precautions into a new future. Whether we are looking at having to navigate a global pandemic, addressing racism and sexism in our country, or simply trying to find a way forward, making such a major shift can be more than a little scary. It is overwhelming to have to account for all the different variables, to try to guess and to figure out where the best path will be. No matter how much we dislike the situation we're in, not knowing what things are going to look like on the other side leaves us feeling very uncertain. Like Mary Magdalene, we need that familiar voice in our ear and in our hearts, calling our name and reminding us that we are not alone. The good news is that in the person of Jesus Christ, God meets us where we are and gives us what we need. The resurrection that we celebrate today is the promise that death is not the end of our story. Challenges, hardships, and difficult times will not last forever. Even though we face uncertainty and wrestle with doubt, God will always be with us. God's power to bring life and to restore what was lost will always be greater than anything the world can throw at us. Lucy Pevensey never gave up trying to share the wonder of Narnia with her siblings. When simply telling them about it didn't work, she found ways to show them. She used her actions to point them in the right direction until they were able to see it for themselves and came to believe. In the same way, we must live the resurrection in our lives, embodying God's hope with our whole beings. On a personal level, this might look like us giving something another try, even if we didn't succeed the first time. It could also mean getting our vaccine and not just going back to business as usual, because living the resurrection should change how we approach things. As a congregation, we have an opportunity to journey with each other, to li lift one another up when we are struggling, and to shoulder each other's burdens, offering hope when someone else most needs it. We live the resurrection when we reach out into our communities through the food pantry, through blood drives, and through other missional opportunities that help give people a leg up or a fresh start. By offering hope and healing to those who have been marginalized, we share in God's work of opening new pathways into the future. And when it comes to engaging the struggles of our nation and our world, we can lend our voices and our efforts to movements seeking to undo systems of oppression, advocating for positive change, and honoring the fact that everyone deserves to be treated like the beloved child of God they are. May it be so according to God's will. Amen.
glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the Lord rise among us. Let it rise. in receiving the good news of the gospel, in being part of the promise of resurrection, we are part of a wondrous gift which God pours out on all creation. As Christ calls in our lives, calling us to live into resurrection ways of being, we have opportunity to respond to that call by offering up our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Even though our building may be closed, the mission and ministry of our congregation continues thanks to your support, financially or otherwise. As you consider your financial gifts this Easter season, we would invite you to think about mailing your offering to the church or dropping it off in the secure drop box outside the front of our building. You can call the church office and we'll help you set up an electronic funds transfer, which will automatically deposit your offering into the church's bank account at a time and amount of your choosing. You can visit our website and give using the secure donation portal online, or you can give using text following the information appearing on your screen. If you are a member of another faith community worshiping with this video, we would encourage you to give financially to your congregation so that your gifts can go to support the mission and ministry and the sharing of the good news in your community. In addition to our financial offerings, God calls us to offer up prayers, not only for ourselves, but for those we love and for those whose names we may not know. Therefore, we invite you now in this time to be a spirit and attitude of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day for this opportunity to celebrate the resurrection, your wondrous victory over death, and promise that hardship and challenge is never the end of our story. We thank you for the signs of spring all around us that serve as reminders of this day and help us to see always that you are present in our midst, your life-giving work all around. We thank you for your son Jesus who lived and walked among us, in whose resurrection we have hope and faith in you. We thank you that because of him we know what it means to live as your faithful disciples and to share the good news with all whom we meet. We thank you also that because he lived with us, he knows what it's like to go through our experiences. He's felt our joy and our sorrow. He's been through our success and our struggle. And so as we offer prayers to you, we do so trusting that you hold them close to your own heart. God, we give you thanks for the many reasons we have to celebrate. Not only this Easter resurrection, but all of those moments in our lives in which we see life-giving work in our midst. We thank you for birthdays and anniversaries, for achievements at school and work, 
for the opportunities to celebrate with one another and to reconnect. We thank you, God, for the opportunities we have to share the good news in our midst, to be in mission and ministry with one another. And in so doing, God, we recognize that there are those who are struggling in this world, both in our communities and elsewhere. We hold before you all those who are dealing with sickness and injury, who are struggling with loneliness and isolation. We pray for those whose communities and lives have been upended by conflict and violence and war, who see nothing around them but death and who long for the promised hope of your resurrection. We pray for those whose lives are affected by disasters, who are struggling with the effects of climate change on their communities. We pray especially for those in the southern United States who are experiencing severe weather and tornadoes, for those in Hawaii still recovering from the mudslides that happened there several weeks ago, and for all who struggle each day in the face of nature's challenges. We pray for those who are dealing with conflict of the soul, who are struggling with darkness in their lives, not knowing where to turn, not knowing where to find hope. Give them strength and courage in the midst of their uncertainty and lift up those whom you have called to reach out to them to be lifelines on your behalf, rebuilding relationship and restoring community. God, we pray for those who've been affected and still continue to be affected by this virus. We give you thanks for the joy and wondrous happiness that folks are feeling being vaccinated and because of those vaccinations being able to reconnect with those they love. We pray for those who are waiting for vaccines, those who are struggling with the virus, those who are putting themselves at risk to care for others and to provide essential services. God, we pray for our leaders. We pray especially for President Biden and his administration, for Governor Evers and those who work with him, for all of our elected officials, wherever they may be serving, that together we might live into your vision for our world, one of your peace, your justice, your love. Holy God, hear our prayers. Give us what we need to celebrate this day and every day hereafter, to live as your beloved children, the resurrection way of being, in which the promise of life and hope are ever present. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is The Day of Resurrection. The words appear on your screen.
friends as we go from this digital space. We know that we do not go alone, but with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit, to love and to serve God and neighbor in all that we do, now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen.